early, even for the pastor to get up, he's tarred. Especially on these days when it gets hot. And uh, you end up spending a lot of time outside and getting worn out. But every time when I walk in here, it feels a little better. You know, and that's because this is where the spirit comes. This is where we come together. And uh, that's energizing. So thank you for being here for, for that. And, you know, back when I was in college, in my early days of studying spirituality, I used to wander the University of Louisville campus. And you can tell that I'm from Louisville because of the way I say Louisville. There's no Louisville. Louisville. I would wander the University of Louisville campus, lost in thought. Eventually find a tree to sit under where I would read books on Buddhism, on Hindu writings called the Upanishads, or on Stoic philosophy. Alternately, I would sometimes head to Louisville's Cherokee Park and sit on Dog Hill, which we had a nickname for, Dog Blank Hill, because that's where everybody took their dogs. I won't say that out loud. Um, I would sit there and study, meditate, taking in the beauty of the park as a part of my day's education. So this past Monday, I decided that I would sit and study scripture in the park there too, here. And I headed out about a block away from the church to sit under a tree at the Old Fort Park. And there I decided I would sit and I would work out the readings for today's sermon. I found myself a good-looking tree, sat down in the grass with my Bible and a cool breeze to accompany my journey through whatever the Holy Spirit was willing to tell me that day. I decided that the park was going to be my office for the afternoon, at least for an hour or two. And as I read through Acts 1 several times, each time a little more slowly than the first, I occasionally looked up and looked around my office. And I became aware that I shared my office with three other people that day. Sometimes it's nice to have company after all. The 11 apostles were staying in a room together, along with Jesus' mother and the other women that they neglected to mention by name, as so often in these scriptures were. Uh, we can't say for sure who the other women were, but we can probably take a good guess. Might have been Mary Magdalene. Would have been a good bet. Mary and Martha of Bethany may have been good bets. Salome, other women that we hear that had prominent roles in the Bible. They were all there, waiting. What were they waiting for? We know what they were waiting for. Because in verse 5, the resurrected Jesus tells them, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. So there they were, just waiting for the Holy Spirit. And we have the benefit of the author narrating this whole thing to us, but let's put ourselves in their places. What would they have been expecting? Would they have any idea what being hit with the Holy Spirit would mean? Would they have any clue what the term Holy Spirit even meant? What exactly were they waiting for? As I pondered this, I looked up, looked around at my co-workers in, the, in my office for the afternoon. Huh, some co-workers they were. They were all asleep. One was asleep on a park bench, and two more were asleep in the grass with bicycles parked nearby. <coughs> I didn't begrudge them for sleeping. Heck, I was kind of jealous. It was a nice day. It was beautiful, and it seemed a nice day for an outdoor nap. But of course, the reality soon set in that they were probably all three homeless. There have been complaints about people who are homeless being pushed off of Canal Street because we certainly wouldn't want the tourists or the locals on their lunch breaks to have the inconvenient reminder that homelessness exists in our community. That's just bad for business. I've heard that this is where a lot of the people sometimes now go for a place to rest and to be away from watchful, disapproving eyes. At least we had somewhere peaceful to be. So here we were, the four of us, in our office. Or perhaps we were in the upper room, like Peter, Mary, James, Salome, and the others, just waiting, 
What were we waiting for? Maybe some of us there were waiting for the Colors of Hunger meal that was about to begin in a couple of hours, just a block away. Or waiting for a call that may give them a job. Or maybe, like the singer John Mayer, they were just waiting for the world to change. Which, by the way, if you've never heard that song by John Mayer, it's a very powerful song if you listen to the lyrics and listen to what it's actually about. So I'm going to read you the lyrics. Pretty fascinating, pretty insightful. The lyrics go like this. Me and all my friends, we're all misunderstood. They say we stand for nothing, and there's no way we ever could. Now we see everything that's going wrong with the world and those who lead it. We just feel like we don't have the means to rise above and beat it. So we keep waiting, waiting for the world to change. We keep on waiting, waiting for the world to change. It's hard to beat the system when you're standing at a distance. So we keep on waiting, waiting for the world to change. Now, if we had the power to bring our neighbors home from war, they would have never missed a Christmas, no more ribbons on their door. And when you trust your television, what you get is what you've got. Because when they own the information, they can bend it all they want. That's why we're waiting, waiting on the world to change. We keep on waiting, waiting on the world to change. And it's not that we don't care, we just know that the fight ain't fair. So we keep on waiting, waiting for the world to change. Maybe that's what they were waiting for in my office, in the park. That may well have been how the disciples felt in the upper room. They may not have understood just how it was going to work, but they were knew that they were waiting for the world to change. John Mayer released this song in 2000, 2006, almost 20 years ago. We're approaching 20 years ago when this song was, was released. We're still waiting. In fact, we've seen change in the world, but sometimes it seems to kind of go the opposite direction. More decisive, more, con more contentious, more hateful. Racially motivated violence has increased. There are now state laws against talking about LGBTQ issues in schools. There's more mass shootings. If you listen to the recording of this song, it has a rather happy sounding music behind it. Really, in the, the intro includes a xylophone and, who can, you know, xylophones, happy sounding sounds. But don't let that fool you. The song's a lament. It's a lament about the absurdity of the present state of things and the reasons that an entire generation has checked out of the process of change. Hear that line, and when you trust your television, what you get is what you got, because when they own the information, oh, they can bend it all they want. That was insightful, and it was many years, actually, before they, they started using the word fake news. It was many years before this was coined on either side of the uh, aisle. And we live in an age where the world's worth, where a world's worth of information is at our fingertips on the internet. But of course, that knowledge can be put there by anyone who knows how to work a computer. So the erosion of expertise is almost complete. Because anyone can post an article on history or start a YouTube channel and claim to be a news journalist or start a podcasting espousing what they claim to be correct theology. And they often get more traction because their information is easier to grasp or because it confirms a person's own biases. Let's face it. We often seek out information that simply confirms what we already believe. There's a word for it. Actually, it's called confirmation bias. And we often hit the back button on our browser when we find things that we didn't actually agree with. We hit the back button and we go back to that Google search. Research is conducted on the internet rather than through scholarly activity, primary sources, and authentic critical thinking. We live in what some have called a post-truth world where facts just don't even matter anymore. 
Because we can create the facts that we need to believe whatever we want to believe. In the song, Mayor goes on to say, it's not that we don't care, we just know that the fight ain't fair. That feels horribly true. You can't beat the system, he laments. Systemic problems plague our society, whether through exploits of capitalism that create general, generational poverty, systemic racism, modern day Jim Crow laws that suppress votes. Maybe these people in this park, my office for that day, just figure they can't beat the system. So they've resorted to just waiting. The psalmist in our reading today says, God gives the desolate a home to live in. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity and the rebellious live in a parched land. But has anybody given these people a home to live in? Maybe some of them are in this situation because they were prisoners in the past, but got no help from society to lead them into prosperity. And do the rebellious live in a parched land? We often see the truly rebellious living as wealthy people. Finding ways out of criminal convictions, living in consequence-free life. They seem to be the ones living in prosperity. And there are other parts of the Bible that confirm that, too. So Tom Petty, another great singer of our time, as some of you found out the other day. Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part. Every day you get one more yard... You take it on faith, you take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. And it is. We are waiting on the world to change. John Mayer's song is an appropriate lament. Sounding just like laments in the Bible. Expressing both the absurdity of the post-truth world. And the hope that it will not always be this way. And true lament always has that. It acknowledges our pain and suffering and the, the things that we feel. And it offers hope. Maybe they are right. Maybe truth doesn't exist anymore. Or at best, we can't separate truth from lies, from opinions, or from pure hatred. But if that's true, if we truly have that freedom, then I'll make a choice. I'll choose to live the truth of Jesus Christ and his message of radical welcome. I will choose to live a life based on love, which is divine action. I will choose to live a life of resurrection, being born again each day into a new kingdom that, keep, that sets the captives free. I will choose to live a life waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit, which we celebrate next week on Pentecost. And with that power of the Holy Spirit, we will finish the song and write a new one where we have become the change. Where the church is a sanctuary for the lost, a hospital for the sick, a balm for the sad and downtrodden. A people of resurrection, of the Holy Spirit, and of Jesus Christ. So spend this week waiting on the Holy Spirit with the disciples. And contemplate what that means. What will you do with your superpower that you receive next week on, on Pentecost? With great power comes great responsibility. What will you do? What will we do with that responsibility? Pay, think about that as we wait for the Holy Spirit and for the power to change the world. Amen.